It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here. This is, boy, this is a banner week for security flaws. Here we are Tuesday, and already there are two major flaws. Uh, Roka, which affects uh, public key crypto in a very serious way. And, of course, you probably all heard about the WPA2 crack, K-R-A-C-K. Well, Steve's got reassuring news in both cases and information on what you need to do to protect yourself. Coming up next on Security Now. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 633, recorded Tuesday, October 17th, 2017. Cracking Wi Fi. Security Now is brought to you by IT Pro TV. A good IT Pro is always learning. And IT Pro TV is the resource to keep you and your IT team's skills up to date. Visit itpro.tv slash security now and use the code SN30 to get a free seven day trial and 30% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. And by Zip Recruiter. Are you looking to hire a tech professional? With ZipRecruiter, you can post to 100-plus job boards, including social networks, all with a single click, screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And by Tongue. Did you know that 90% of bad breath comes from your tongue? The world's most effective tongue cleaning system, the Tongue Brush and Gel, takes only 10 seconds. Discover confidence and freshness like never before. For 10% off the partner pack and free shipping, visit tonguebrush.com slash security now and use the offer code security now. It's time for Security Now, the show where we talk about your security uh, and privacy. And man, everybody is just dying to hear what Steve has to say this week. Hello, Steve Gibson. Whoops. Thank God this did not happen on Wednesday. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. We would have been. Or, we would have had to do a or, special redo or, or later today. Yes, yeah. thank. I mean, I. It's wonderful when these things drop on Monday because then everyone's all revved up and and there's enough information for me to talk about. Yeah, it's if just, it happened Tuesday, or, that would have been bad too. Really, Monday's the best day. Yeah, we for, please if we could have the major security problems hit on Monday. There was even a little bit of wind up Sunday evening. The sort of the news of something about to happen the next day uh, began to to leak out on on Sunday, and it's like, okay, this doesn't sound good. Mm -mm. So, consequently, Security Now episode six thirty three for October seventeenth, twenty seventeen, cracking with a K, of course. Wi-Fi, mm -mm -mm. um, which will be our main topic. But there was another problem also yesterday. Both of them happened. Then the other one we're going to talk about first, and we'll deal with uh, with the crack crack or the crack attack or the release of the Kraken or whatever you want to say at the end of the podcast. But Roca, R-O-C-A, is, I would argue much worse interest but hasn't hmm. hasn't gotten nearly as much attention because it's not as sexy right um and doesn't have as good a name <laughs> you got to give these things a good name remember like heart bleed oh my god uh. so uh so we're going to talk about roca which is a massive industry-wide failure of an embedded cryptographic library in in five years of Infineon's chips, which are everywhere, which has uh, until now been unknowingly producing weekly, um, weak public keys that can be factored, which is the whole thing you don't want in a public key. Uh, and they're everywhere, like BitLocker is not safe. So, um, you know, this is like, as, as I said, arguably a much bigger problem. The, the crack attack is not good, but we'll explain all about that. It's 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 definitely needs to be fixed, but it's not the end of the world that we don't need WPA three or anything else. Um, also, I read an interesting piece by an ad blocking company 
which started off talking about the surprise the surprising prevalence of web-based cryptocurrency mining, which we were talking about last week. And remember, I, I said I think it was during the, the our 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 closing the loop uh, loop back with our comments from our listeners that. You know, it you know it's sort of annoying that your computer is being commandeered while you're visiting one of these websites, but it's not a security risk. They're just taking your processor time. But these guys, and, and as I was reading this, I had a thought that hadn't occurred to me last week, and then they ended up presenting it, and I thought, oh, well, okay, good. So we'll talk about that. Um, a really interesting, worrisome look at iOS dialogue password spoofing. Um, also, Google has formally announced the advanced protection program that we that we expected to come out and we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, we've got some comments from our listeners. And then we're going to take a deep dive into CRACK, K-R-A-C-K, which is an acronym for Key Reinstallation Attack. That's where they get the CK from at the end of the attack. Uh, which is effective against all not yet patched systems or those like by Windows and iOS that never implemented it correctly in the first place and as an interesting side effect aren't subject to this main Isn't problem. That so that was, that was what Renee was speculating is that maybe the reason that some of these devices aren't vulnerable is they don't do it this, the proper way. <laughs> Correct. Which is crazy. They screwed up, <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, uh, it turns the attack out, uh, doesn't work here. That was a good yeah. idea. But even so, Windows did quietly fix this officially in last Tuesday's uh, second Tuesday of the month update. So they got it, and we know that Apple has betas in the works, and and we expect to have what probably eleven point zero point four, or maybe maybe it'll be eleven point one. Yeah, and of course. We just hope they keep fixing iOS because, boy, it's still a catastrophe. Yeah, it's 11.1, so, and I have 11.1. Oh, okay. So everybody who has a beta, public or a developer beta, ah. should be up to date and secure cool. its only devices. And then, uh, you know what? Uh, Eero's doing the same thing. I checked with our sponsor uh, to see what they were going to do, and they're in beta. So I, I guess the mitigation isn't hard, but everybody reasonably wants to test it a little bit before they push it out to everybody. Well, and what's interesting is that access points don't need to be updated. That's the other thing everybody has missed. Oh. So I w there's no need at all. It's the clients that are the oh, problem, not, okay. not the access points. Oh. The yes. So, but but what's inter but that you know, but access points are still going to fix their protocol. So this is one nice way of measuring how you feel yes. about your access point yes. provider yes. is, you know, I, I heard you mention, for example, that DDWRT is already fixed. It is. And Ubuntu is. And, you know, and, and a lot of them are. So but, but as I, I'll, I'll explain why this is the case. It's only if access points were connecting to each other. Then that because in oh. that case, one of them is a client of the other, and the attack is against the client, not against the access point. I did not understand that. See, this is why we needed you. Well, that's fantastic. <laughs> what I'm happy to provide. So I think we got a great podcast and uh, we'll, with lots of information. That is real. Boy, that's okay. Man, I'm as always, Steve's the best. And, and when things like this happen, Invariably, the first thing I hear is, okay, okay, Steve's going to talk about this, right? <laughs> yes, he is. And Roka, too, uh, which I'm happy to say all my keys are secure from Roka because I checked them right away. Uh, our show today brought to you by IT Pro TV. If you're an IT professional or you want to become an IT professional, you need to know Tim and Don and the gang at IT Pro TV. They've created a really brilliant idea for people who want to learn. IT skills, but they don't want to spend a lot of money on a technical school. And, man, it is a lot of money or even just the, the, the materials. And, frankly, some of us don't learn from a book very well. IT Pro TV is kind of like watching Twit, except imagine if this show were all about things like uh, uh, managing 
uh, exchange uh, servers or Microsoft networks or or Kali Linux or Linux security techniques or ITIL or ISC squared or security certs or all CI, uh, CISSP. Imagine if you could get the cert, learn about all the techniques and skills and even take practice exams on your TV, on, well, uh, everything, your computer, your tablet, on your Roku, your Apple TV, your Amazon Fire, your iOS and Android. They have apps. That's what IT Pro TV is all about. It's about making this engaging training. It's easy. It's fun to learn and putting it everywhere you want to use it. Uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, last year, there were more than 1 million job openings in the cybersecurity field. I bet that number is higher this year. Guarantee you it is. This is a great opportunity. Take advantage of it. Polish your skills with IT Pro TV's online IT training. They started with, like we did, with one studio. Then they built another. Now they're up to five, five studios running, you know, nine to five, Monday through Friday. They had 125 hours every week of content, thousands of hours already done on demand. Every possible area, every possible cert if you want to learn how to use Wireshark, you can do it on IT Pro TV. If you want to learn digital forensics for law enforcement, that's where you go, IT Pro TV, and on and on and on. Now, they also that's for individuals. They also, and a lot of teams use it. They have a team solution. Uh, and, of course, you want cross-training. You want your team to learn more skills in different areas. The team solution gives you group pricing. You get access to IT Pro TV's uh, really nice supervisor portal which means that uh, as the supervisor, you control the training schedule for your whole team. You can create custom groups. You can give training assignments out. You can see individual analytics, group analytics. You can view logins, viewing time, video downloads, track course completion. I mean, it's really everything you need to make sure your team is keeping those skills up to date now more than ever. That's really important. So remember this, IT Pro. Dot TV. That's the website, itpro.tv slash security now. If you go there, you can, as an individual, you can sign up for a free seven-day trial. And if you use the offer code SN30, get 30% off for the lifetime of your active membership. So that's a really good deal. That's that's on the uh, the monthly membership. But if you if you are a group, if you if you run a team, you can go in there and get a request a free demo of the supervisor portal as well. It's itpro.tv slash security now. Uh, don't forget the offer code SN30 to try it free for seven days and get 30% off. That's for individuals and for uh, for teams. They got a great team portal. Check it out too. Same place, itpro.tv slash security now. Okay, Steve. So we have a fun cartoon for the week that is about this problem. Uh, unfortunately, it's incorrect, but it is fun oh, nonetheless. Dear. <laughs> oh, dear. So we've got we got two guys sitting. Uh, one one's got a cup of coffee in his hand. The other's eating a burger. They're in an office, and the third guy comes rushing in, sw swings the door open in a panic, and says, "Oh no, they found a vulnerability in WPA2. We can't trust any Wi-Fi anymore. We need to change every router, starting with ours." And so the bearded guru who's sitting down with his burger says, calm down, guys. We'll just need to update the firmware and everything will be fine. The guy who was initially panicked says, are you sure? And the bearded guy says, yes. We just need to wait for the manufacturers to release a patch for all their router models and then for all the sysadmins to flash <laughs> all the new firmware. <laughs> And then the fourth frame shows three skeletons. <laughs> they need spider uh, webs. <laughs> exactly. And, and in fact, the, the, uh, in, in the initial three, there was a small flower in the plant. And in the final one, there's like five flowers and the vine has wandered off the desk because so much time has passed. So the point being, aha, uh -huh, and that'll never happen. So the good news is, as we just said at the top, and I'll explain why, it doesn't matter. So, uh, Roka first. Um, so both of these problems, the, the, the crack with a K and Roka are 
subjects of the upcoming ACM Conference on Computer and Communication Security, known as the CCS, the ACM CCS, which is the major annual ACM conference of the Special Interest Group on Security, which this year promises to be a barn burner. Um, so not only, only will only you <laughs> would call a security conference a barn burner, <laughs> but I know what you I know what you mean. I know what you that's, mean. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no barns were harmed no. during the production of this podcast. <laughs> so not only will the presentation of the crack attack be there, which, as I said, we'll, we'll be talking about in detail at the end of the podcast, but so also will a I would argue even more unsettling discovery by a team of researchers in the Czech Republic, the UK and Italy from several universities. ROCA, R-O-C-A, as in almond, uh, stands for Return of Coppersmiths Attack. And wow. then the, the yes, return R-O-C-A, Return of Coppersmiths Attack, a practical factorization of widely used RSA. So, okay, Coppersmith is a, Don Coppersmith is a well-known cryptographer with a long resume of cryptographic accomplishments to his name. He developed one of the many improvements of factorization, of, of factoring, uh, which of course are is, is a concern everybody has because we rely on the intractability of performing a prime factorization of two very large primes after being multiplied. You know, ha we're, we're relying on the fact that it's it is, is computationally infeasible to, to demultiply them, to factor them, to break them back apart after, after the two large primes have been multiplied. So, so, it turns out that, um, you know, we're often talking about uh, about the importance of that problem, the, the the how crucial it is. And in fact, the worry of quantum computing is that there will be a way to apply the power of quantum computing to this problem, which is why cryptographers and, and academics are already talking about a different, a next generation of crypto that will be quantum proof because the worry is eh, factorization may no longer be quantum proof once quantum computers develop enough strength. So there's will, I'm sure in the future we'll be talking about lattice based cryptography, which is already known to be quantum proof. Okay. So, um, one of the things that we all we all also often talk about is the distinction between theory and practice. That is, it's important that you put into practice properly what the academics have figured out in theory, um, because of course implementation is where the rubber hits the road, and that's what actually matters. What these guys uncovered was a doozy of a mistake which exists in the embedded cryptographic library used by Infineon's products. Okay, now, I mean, Infineon is everywhere. They're one of the major embedded crypto people. Uh, their stuff is in the trusted platform modules, the TPM, especially uh, version 1.2, which is the one that's around that most of us have in all of our machines oh, well, today. That's a very big deal. I didn't realize yes. that. Oh. Yes. And BitLocker uses TPM for its key. And it turns out that if you have BitLocker running on a machine with TPM 1.2, it almost certainly has Infineon in it. And the public key it would have generated can be factored. Wow, so, that's really bad news. <laughs> it's really bad news. These guys scanned the internet. They found thousands of public keys 
that can be factored. They, 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 they looked through GitHub and found a ton of public keys on GitHub that were being used to protect things with which, but were not providing protection. So, um, so the, the problem is huge. Um, this impacts one flavor of Yubico, uh, and there, and, and Yubico responded instantly. They knew about this a while ago. They've, they've been safe, I think, since July. The researchers discovered the problem in January of this year. January of this year, right? So 10 months ago, they informed Infineon in February and negotiated an eight-month silent period knowing that they'd be presenting this at the ACM CCS meeting uh, at the end of October, it's October 30th through the beginning of November, the first few days of November. So Infineon's had time, words gotten out quietly to those people who are being affected. And so, so there's, there's, um, there's been time for remediation. Uh, Yubico, if anyone is a Yubico customer and concerned, they've got, uh, you, uh, Yubico immediately put up a page to, to help identify which of their products might be affected. Most of them aren't. I think it's the YubiKey 4 when you use it to synthesize the public key. Uh, that's what I thought. Okay, good. Because yes. that, that is a feature of the Yubico 4. You can generate private keys and keep them your PGP key on there. But if you – and I never did that because I don't uh, – for one thing, you can't put it anywhere else. It's on the key. Um, right. Okay, good. All right. So it's only in the case only that you, you do that. It so it's a relatively okay. small attack surface in that case, but there were all they also found a ton of insecure PGP keys. So Really? So I mean, oh yeah, I mean the, 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 the I mean Infineon is just everywhere. Yeah, see I generate so, mine in software. So Yes, I'm and so okay. you're okay. Yeah. Yes. So um so this this got introduced in 2012. So for the last five years, this has been a problem. Okay, so let's take a look at what this means. Uh, first of all, the I think it, it well it's a mixed blessing. It's good news, unfortunately, for both people with keys and bad guys who want to attack them. That it that any public key can be almost instantly, like as in a millisecond, so effectively instantly, tested for as, as a candidate for easy factorability. And there are online, there are online websites, there are online and offline tools, everything is open source, MIT licensed, so it can be, so the, so the, Code that have been, have been has been produced can be put into other tools or products, and so so there are a lot of resources to allow people to check their own public keys to see yay or nay whether that key would be vulnerable to this essentially factorability short circuit. So, okay, so to give us some context here, the worst cases for the factorization of, of a 1024 or 2048 bit keys would be less than three CPU months for the 1024 bit or 100 CPU years for the 2048 bit. Okay, so first of all, that's interesting. So, and this is another important lesson for us is that doubling the bit length of RSA didn't double the difficulty. It went from, what, what was it? That would be 400 times harder. Three CPU months, which is to say one quarter of a CPU year compared to 100 CPU years. So 400 times harder to factor a 2048-bit key. Uh, now that's on a single core recent CPU. So nothing GPU, nothing fancy, no hardware assistance, just a standard CPU, just to give us some sense for, for that. But that's the worst case. The expected time is half that because you're, you're doing 
a bunch of guessing and you may just get lucky. So generally about half of that is what's expected. However, this, this factorization problem can be performed in parallel across multiple CPUs, allowing for practical factorization in hours or days. So, okay, now, and I should say, this is the, this is the, if your key is weak, that is, if this test reveals that you have a weak key, this is how quick it can be done. It should be vastly harder. Um, a properly generated 2048-bit RSA public key should require several quadrillion years. So that, that's hundreds of thousands of times the age of the universe. You know, we, we throw these large numbers around casually, but when you're at hundreds uh, of thousands of times the age of the universe, you probably are safe as long as nobody made a mistake. And the point was, somebody did. The the 2048-bit keys that this broken library has, which has been embedded into Infineon's hardware, can be broken in not several quadrillion years, but a hundred simple CPU years. <laughs> oh, that's a little so, different. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So, to put, a, to put some cost on this, in the case of the broken the broken public key, the worst case price of factorization on an Amazon AWS C4 computation instance for the 1024-bit key would be $76. Wow. Uh-huh. And the 2048-bit key costs more. That's 40000 But... Obviously, well within the price, well within the budget of a corporation, someone, or certainly a state actor who's got essentially infinite money, um, and half that would be again typical. So about twenty thousand dollars worth of Amazon AWS C4 computation time, hmm. and you get to crack one of these weak keys. So, in a you, scenario, uh, would be maybe you had a, a competitor's laptop. And on and it was an encrypted hard drive, and on that he's using yep. TPM, and on that laptop were presumably uh, uh, secrets of interest to you. You could for forty grand un unencrypt it, basically. Yes. Wow. Yes. E exactly. Wow. Yes. So, you know, in a in a for a reasonable price in a short time, way down from <clears throat> several quadrillion years. <laughs> How much is that in so, Amazon <laughs> compute? <laughs> Actually, really, this may be more of a statement of how cheap you know, it's, it is to get compute it, time. It's, it's free because you'd never have a chance to pay the bill. <laughs> the bill would never come. Yeah. It's like, no, we're still working. I'll let my great-grandchildren pay that bill. <laughs> right. That's hysterical. Okay, so um, – uh, they disclosed it, as I mentioned, to Infineon in February. So everybody's been scrambling. Well, as an uh, example, Microsoft Ubi Ubico says every key we've sold since June is fixed. Yes. So they've exactly. known for a while. Yes, yeah. exactly. So uh, Microsoft, Google, HP, Lenovo, Fujitsu, they've all already released software updates. On the other hand, a laptop that doesn't get those isn't fixed. So, so very much as with the, the crack attack that we'll be wrapping up today with, you, you know, this is an instance where you really do want to use the you know, so, sort of ignore the advice of, which is typical for firmware, of if it's working fine, don't mess with it. In, in this case, uh, it's actually, it only appears to be working fine. So, you definitely want to make sure, especially if you have TPM version 1.2, because that's where the problem is. Apparently, one didn't have this because it's older than this library, which only appeared in, in 2005. I mean, sorry, two, uh, 2012. Okay, so uh, the, these guys, as I mentioned, scanned the net, found thousands of keys 
found PGP keys, uh, found keys on GitHub. So apparently people have been using this Infineon library for producing keys, just figuring, oh, you know, hardware is better than software. Uh, not in this case. Um, they also looked at 41 laptop models that used TPM modules. They found vulnerable TPMs, trusted platform modules, from Infineon in 10 of the 41. Um, and uh, and in, the, in their own disclosure, they note that they, they said the vulnerability is especially acute for TPM version 1.2 because the keys it uses to control Microsoft's BitLocker hard disk encryption can be factored. So anyone who obtains a Windows machine with a BitLocker encrypted drive on top of TPM 1.2 may not be secure. So what that says is you'll want to fix your hardware and then rekey your BitLocker using an updated key from the Trusted Platform module. And I'm sure there will be remediation uh, details available as soon as this all happens. So both online and offline detection tools have been provided. They're open source and, as I mentioned, released under the MIT license so they can be put into other solutions. The best vulnerability test suite is keychest.net slash roca k-e-y-c-h-e-s-t dot n-e-t forward slash roca um, so the researchers wrote our work highlights the dangers of keeping the design secret and the implementation closed source oh i forgot to mention that the way they found this was just by having some Infineon hardware generate a whole crap load of keys, of, of, of public keys, all presumably safe. And these guys studied the output and found the weakness. It would have been so much easier if, as academic crypto researchers, they'd been able to look at the code. But it's closed. And so they had to go through the extra work of essentially looking at the output and reverse engineering, discovering and reverse engineering the problem from the result. So they said our work highlights the dangers of keeping the design secret and the implementation closed source, even if both are thoroughly analyzed and certified by experts. They wrote the lack of public information causes a delay in the discovery of flaws and hinders the process of checking for them, thereby increasing the, the number of already deployed and affected devices at the time of detection. So, you know, so of course, Infineon's not happy. They've, they've, act, they've acted as responsibly as they can, but unfortunately, this is firmware embedded into hardware. So, Getting to it is a little less easy than it is on, you know, for OS updates and app updates and, and the, the sorts of things we're seeing all the time. And also probably requires more user interaction. So uh, and we'll be talking, of course, again, about um, about how crack relates to this. Ubico's page is ubico.com slash key check. And uh, I've got a link in the show notes to the paper where they they describe all this but so basically there there was a well five years ago a a weak library or a flawed library which was supposed to be producing strong public keys wasn't and it because it's from a, a well-known good manufacturer i mean i'm sure infineon is not happy about this um, there, it was they, these keys are well used and prevalent, so uh, it is possible to check any if you've got them to quickly determine instantly whether it's vulnerable or not. And not all of them that are produced by by this library are vulnerable, so so it, it's worth checking rather than you know immediately panicking. And if you're able to rekey 
once this is fixed or just rekey from a from a software based source as, as you did leo then that makes a lot of yeah. sense too I, I actually was looking into because i i thought it's time i read a really good article saying don't keep your private keys uh, on the internet, which I don't do, or even on an internet accessible device, like put them on a USB key and put it away. And so I was thinking I, another place to put it would be, of course, a YubiKey. And then uh, I noted that you could generate a, U, a, a PGP key on YubiKey, uh, the, the YubiKey 4. It has enough horsepower to do that. But then you can't put it anywhere else. And if you lose that one, you're out of luck. So what I decided to do is, yes, generate a new key, put it on the YubiKey, but generate it in software using uh, Open GP right. GPG, and then put it on the Yuba key and put it on a separate USB key in a drawer somewhere, f so that the private key isn't publicly available. That's a little less convenient. But if it's on the Yuba key, I think you be I think you mean so that the public key is not publicly available. No, the public key has to be publicly available, or it wouldn't be very useful. The private key is the one you use to ad ad authenticate the public key, so that you want to keep very close to your chest. You you put the public key out. And so that's the problem is that it's the public key that gets factored. Oh, screw that. But I'm going to make it <laughs> but I'm going to make it with safe software. <laughs> Correct. Right. Of course, yes, the public key is 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 the weak link. Right. The private key wouldn't be cuz nobody has it. And that's why it's private. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, I want to keep my private key private not because of Roka. But you're right. I will. Uh, but but I checked immediately. Went to that Roka tester, which, by the way, is down uh, right now. The one that you. Uh, well, it's probably just submerged. Yeah, it's they say probably, we're, they say key chest is upgrading our system, <laughs> which uh, means yeah, it means it got clobbered. But when I heard yeah. about this yesterday, I ran all my keys through it, and uh, all of them passed because they were all software generated. Yes. Yeah. Good. Good. Sorry, I didn't mean to well, interrupt. Oh no, no, that that that's a good segue. So um, the. Prevalence of web-based cryptocurrency mining. And this has an interesting twist to it. So uh, there is a well-known popular advertising blocker, an ad blocker called AdGuard. And they took it upon themselves to just sort of do a little research into the prevalence of cryptocurrency mining. We talked about it. I think it was just last week or maybe the week before about the fact that while, yes, it might be annoying if you go to an adult content site or a torrent or a pirate TV site or something, they, they tend to be the shadier sites on the net. Um, if, you're, if your processor gets pinned because you've got JavaScript trying to do mining, and I mean, oh my God, I, <laughs> I can't think of anything less efficient than using JavaScript for mining. But as we said last week, it's not a security compromise. It's just an annoyance. It and it may even and be a, a somewhat legitimate way of monetizing, right? Well, that's where we're headed ah, with this, okay. is that wouldn't you rather, yes. since it isn't a security problem, wouldn't you rather let the site you're visiting run mining on yes. your computer rather than having you look at ads that are annoying because it's not cycles you really care about right unless you're mobile issue. if you're mobile yeah, then different. maybe yeah. it does matter because yeah. you're you know you're going to get your phone's going to heat up when you're there but <laughs> they kill laptop, battery life yeah yes yeah. for a laptop and a desktop if if i had a choice of letting a site i visit borrow my computer for the sake of monetizing my presence while I'm on the site. I mean, and for example, if the page is in the foreground, not if I switch away to a different tab, then it's like, okay, sorry, I'm not looking at you anymore. So the idea is all of the proper influences align. The more you, the longer time you spend, the more the, the, the more frequently you go back, the more you know the, the longer you are there looking at their content, the greater the chance that lightning will strike because that's about what it is these days on on scoring a coin. Um, the, and your computer will generate a, a Bitcoin on behalf of, and for the benefit of that site. And for large sites, with enough users, the, the numbers begin to make sense. Um, these guys note that even though the, the 
incremental amount of revenue generated is not great, neither is it for ads. And so ads are also working on the large population model, and so does mining. So uh, we have a little, a, an interesting picture here in the show notes that from, from, from their blog posting, from the adguard.com blog post, where they said, three weeks into crypto mining going viral, 220 of the top 100,000 websites are currently crypto have, are offering crypto mining scripts yeah what? um and those sites at based on the popularity of those sites 500 million users what? were doing mining on behalf of those sites during that period of time and it's estimated that those sites earned about $43,000 in those three weeks. So this is actually great. I, now, everybody in the chat room is going, I'm never going to do that. No way. I don't want to. But it, if it's got no impact on you. Correct. It's it, not a security it, vulnerability. You're already running JavaScript like crazy. Yeah. That's doing all kinds of yeah. tracking crap. You know, so do they do these know. sites do it explicitly? Are they I mean, I've never seen this. Is somebody saying, hey, no. if no, see, that's what they need no. to do. Yes, you have a choice. Exactly. Do you want exactly. ads or do you want us to use crypto mining software? Exactly. So the idea would be that in the same way that we use that our browsers had a DNT, a do not track flag that they sent with every query, they uh, our browsers could have a a you may mine on me flag. <laughs> and so you'd be saying, and so when your browser says that, the site says, oh, good. We'd rather mine anyway than annoy you with ads. So you get an ad-free page and your processor gets pinned. And uh, there's some probability that your browser will succeed the Bitcoin or the whatever cryptocurrency it is challenge and the site will and the and the web server will score some cryptocurrency. And it might even be possible to pool. That is to use mining pooling to get incremental revenue just be based on the total amount of time that a site is spent mining. I have to talk to Mark Thompson, who's spent you know, who really understands this stuff upside down and backwards but uh, i th i agree leo i think it's a really interesting monetization solution one that makes absolute sense it's going to be hard to convince people but i think man if i thought if i thought i could get away with it i'd do it <laughs> <laughs> uh i mean what a, uh, it seems completely reasonable i mean i Agree. I can't see a downside. And it, and it, people are saying, well, what about the electrical costs? In aggregate, it will be high because that's the nature of Bitcoin mining. But to any individual, it's not even going to be a penny. Yes, it's so distributed. The whole thing is so distributed that I think it makes sense. And, you know, I mean, if, if you put your hand, you know, next to your computer and looked at the heat that's being pumped out of the it's fan. Working. It's working anyway. Yes. People say, how much bandwidth will it use? None. None. It's all local. None. Yes. I think yes. We'd, have to, I, we'd have to educate people if we were going to try this. I'd do it in a minute. The problem is I don't really... I, wouldn't it be great if I could figure out some way, as you're listening to a show, <laughs> that it's Bitcoin mining in the background. And, you know, two hours later, you, you know, uh, we paid for security now. Cost us a thousand dollars an hour to do a show. Could you, if you had enough listeners or viewers, make a? Th I bet you could make a thousand dollars an hour. Be this way anyway. It's an interesting thought. I'm happy. It, it really is, folks. I wouldn't do it without telling you, and I have no plans to do it. <laughs> just, but it's. I think it's a great idea. I do too. I I just. I mean, and and it hit me as I was reading along. Thinking, you know, when I and, and then they, it's the way they ended their blog post. They, I mean, and here's an ad blocking company. Their whole business is to block this. And by the way, you block Origin already does, and ad block 
Pro or Plus, uh, uh, Adblock Plus does. So there's already been a response by the by the controllers in the industry to this. But I'd be inclined to say, uh, yeah, let's allow mining if it means that I get a better, you know, if I could support the sites where I'm visiting. I mean, OK, Wikipedia. Fine. Mine on my machine while I'm browsing Wikipedia in order to, to send some money to them. Why wow. Not? Oh, I would do that. I already send them like $100 a month. I would. That would be a good thing for me. Wikipedia yeah. won't put ads on. Kudos to Jimmy Wales for not doing that. Yep. Yep. Uh, I think that's a very responsible thing to do, but that means they have to beg. And so the idea would be in that in, in, in the Wikipedia model, you they, they could present a banner. If they see that your browser does not have a cookie explicitly allowing mining and they say, hi, if you would like to support our site, please allow us to run Bitcoin mining on your computer uh, in, uh, in your browser while you're on Wikipedia. And so you click yes. And that's and that's so that sets a static cookie. And from then on, every time you go to Wikipedia, the mining starts up. Maybe there's a little banner that say, hi, thank you for your support. We are currently mining Bitcoin on right. your computer. Did it scare people like crazy? It could be totally done. Well, somebody said you, you got it. It's all in the naming. You got it. The chat room says you can call it ethical mining. Oh, I like it. <laughs> Uh, Thank you, Dave Redekop. That's uh, Nerds on Site. He says, "Ah, uh, perfect. Yes, David. EMO, Ethical Mining Operation. I love it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's one of those ex ideas that's brilliant, and uh, and I just feel like people are so scared of the whole idea they wouldn't they wouldn't they don't like the idea of somebody running a program on their computer. It, we do SETI hello? at home. It's like when SETI you go at home. to a browser. What are you doing? I mean, see, that's what you're that's doing. just it. Is that JavaScript is going insane right. on our every time we go anywhere on the internet? Right. I mean, and that's why I gave up. Remember, no script. I was pushing no script forever until I finally said, okay, it just breaks mm. everything. Mm. I know the what you're saying. The reason it breaks everything. Clean Bitcoin. No. Or right. clean coin. Clean coin. Oh. <laughs> clean coin. Uh. Mm. We can set up a Dogecoin mining operation. You never make any money, but. All right. I'm not going to do it. Don't worry, folks. Okay. Uh, time for a break. We're yes. 45 minutes in. Good man. This is how we make money <laughs> with explicit advertising. Well, no, the advertising. No, that's the wrong way to put it. There's no explicit in the advertising. It's just we're explicitly uh, advert. Never mind. I don't know. You got the butt wipes, Leo. That's <laughs> we're going to do the the tooth, the tongue brush in a bit. But first, I want to talk about ZipRecruiter for people who are hiring. And you know who you are, who you are. if you're a small business and you're short. Uh, of course, it always happens, right? The time you've got to hire somebody is when you're shorthanded and you have the least amount of time possible. Or a big business who knows the perfect employees out there somewhere, but it's just they're too tired <laughs> to find that person. Stop and go to ZipRecruiter. This is going to change your hiring life. With ZipRecruiter, first of all, this is the easy thing. Uh, it's not the most important thing, but it's the easy thing. With ZipRecruiter, you post to 100-plus job boards with one post on ZipRecruiter. Actually, that is one of the most important things because the the wider the net you cast, the more likely it's going to hit that. that there's a, somebody out there is perfect for that job. You can't wait to work with them. They're hard workers. They love what they do. They love being there with you, and you're going to love being there with them. And that's like just it's hiring nirvana. Where are what board? What job board are they on? What are they watching? Where? How do you get to them? With ZipRecruiter, you can uh, reach candidates everywhere in the country for any possible skill set with one post. Plus, the thing that scares people when I say that is, what you, are you telling me that you're going to all these people are going to be calling me? No, 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 no. All of the candidates roll into the ZipRecruiter interface. No, no emails, no phone calls. It all goes to the ZipRecruiter interface. And what's great about this? Oh. And I think I like this the best of all. You can have screeners there, screening questions. You have true, false, multiple choice, essay questions, whatever, that will screen out people who just don't fit. Can you work Monday through Friday, 9 to 5? No. Screen them out. Actually, for us, can you work weekends is a big one, right? Because that's most of our stuff is done on weekends. If they said no, I'd say, well, thanks, but I need somebody who can work weekends. I don't even have to look at that resume. So you screen out the people you don't want. 
or who just don't fit the needs. You All the resumes are formatted in the same format, so you can scan them very quickly. You can rank them. They've got a really cool system. And then the right person just percolates to the top. It isn't. It couldn't be easier. And the way it works is so good with their smart matching technology. Uh, they actively notify candidates because they have already millions of resumes on file. People come to ZipRecruiter looking for work too, right? So they can immediately actively notify qualified candidates about your job within minutes. So you're going to get matches right away. In fact, unlike hiring sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on the right candidates finding you. It finds them. And it finds them fast. 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in less than one day. Less than one day. I don't, I don't know why you're not using ZipRecruiter. It's the smartest way to hire. You could try it free right now. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. If you're not the hiring person in your in your business, go tell them. Because they're going to bake you a birthday cake. They're going to they're gonna buy you flowers. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Try it free right now. It is simply the smartest way to hire. We've used it and love it. So have millions of other big companies. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Fortunately, I am not on the market for a security guru. We have one that we could never replace. Mr. Steve Gibson. So glad you're part of our family of show hosts. Me too. Yeah. Well, you know, so for instance, we're every show is going to talk about crack and Roca. Every show. But everybody knows that if you want to know the deep details of this stuff, where do you go? Tuesday, security now. That's it. So, And security research, please release your, your security bulletins on Monday. Yes. Perfect. That time. would be yeah. much appreciated. Yeah, we really like that. So this was an interesting piece of work uh, by a guy named Felix Krauss. Um, and, uh, it got sent to me by one of our listeners, and I thought, oh, you know, this really does raise a very good point. Um, and that is, it is easy to obtain yeah. someone's iOS password. I've thought this for a long time, and I didn't want to say it. Just ask. Yep. And yes, on the show notes, we have a side-by-side -side sample of a something real from iOS and then a sample pop-up generated by a phishing application. Can I just and, say, I feel like this is a problem across the board, OAuth notifications yes. when people ask me to sign into Google, because there's no certificate attached to these pop-ups. Yes. It's very hard to validate. Yes. What would you click on to know if this? It looks exactly the same. Yes, and and the problem is, and and as Felix notes, we have trained people to simply enter whatever is asked of them because there is, I mean, there's no model, no no robust, no rigorous model for when we should receive one of these. These little sign into iTunes things pop up all the time. And seemingly and randomly. We've talked about this yes. before. You say, in fact, I remember. I said, why, Steve, why? And you said, well, I can only assume that Apple knows that there's a potential problem at this point, so they yep. want to re-authenticate. But, no, yep. but end users don't know why. They just, nope. and we're trained to say, okay, fine, another Apple password pop-up. Yep, in fact, uh, Felix says, iOS asks the user for their iTunes password for many reasons. Yes. The most common ones are recently installed iOS operating system updates mm -hmm. or iOS mm -hmm. apps that mm -hmm. are stuck during installation. Oh. As a result, users are trained to just enter their uh, Apple ID password whenever iOS prompts you to do so. Yep. However, those pop-ups are not only shown on the lock screen and the home screen, but also inside random apps. For example, when they want to access iCloud, Game Center, or in-app purchases. This could easily, he writes, be abused by an app. Just by showing a UI alert controller, which is the name of that in the, in, in the, uh, in the developer docs, that looks exactly like the system dialog. Even users who know a lot about technology have a hard time detecting that those alerts are phishing attacks. And, and looking at it, there's no way to tell. You can't. There's no way. 
Now, you, he, he, all, he went on further. I didn't show another sample. But in this instance, he is showing your email. Uh, uh, so the app would have to know that, which, frankly, is probably not hard for, or not impossible for it to know. But there are other iOS real dialogues that don't provide your Apple ID as a reminder. And so, you, you know, again, a user, and, and even if there weren't, but there are, but even if there weren't, a user is still going to see that and go, okay, I don't know why, but my phone wants me to enter this. So they're going to. Here's a, somebody in the chat room, uh, Don S., says, when I see those, I press, the, on the iOS anyway, I press the home button, maybe even twice, because iOS will ignore those. It will sit on that screen until you sign it. But apps cannot. Yes, yeah. and that is exactly what Felix, trick. That, that is what Felix said. That is his solution to uh, this, okay. is when you see that, press the home button. It won't work if it's a real one. Very interesting. Of course, it doesn't solve the OAuth Google OAuth pop-up problem no. or any of this. And in fact, where, where what the, my work in the last week on Squirrel has been exactly this problem. Uh, that is because the, the, what we're just talking about here with the iOS pop-ups, that's a an instance of the bigger problem of spoofing. Spoofing is just, it's the intractable problem because it involves the human factor. Yeah. And so we're, as you know, we're down very near the end of this of of the squirrel project and someone brought up the point that a web page could present a dialogue that looked just like the yes. like the standard squirrel yes. login you know prompt and and how would anybody know and so essentially i've duplicated the uac look that that windows adopted for this reason to to create something that a web browser can't do because ah. the web browser never has control outside of its own borders. That's why Windows darkens everything. Yes. And, and yeah, that's interesting. And I'm doing the same so thing. I, 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 I'm, I monochrome and darken the screen Smart. so the dialogue stands out and a browser can't do that. But but unfortunately, th I mean, this is the, in general spoofing. It, it leverages the human factor and there's just not a good solution to it. It's another reason why uh, you should be concerned about this uh, feature in Android that applications can write over other applications. Right. A feature right, a right, Google right. won't fix yep. because it's used by Facebook for uh, chat, head, chat bubbles. Exactly. And other, yeah. But that's exactly how you'd use that. You'd just write over another application. Yeah, making it and, even and more you, hard to, to exactly, detect. and and you can't tell yep. uh, who who you're Who's talking to. Yep, yep. Wow. So uh, Google did uh, uh, follow through with what we were expecting. We talked about it. I think it was just last week. The so-called APT, the Advanced Protection Program, it has gone live. I've got. Uh, uh, a, a screenshot of Google's announcing it, you know, with with their get started button, and they're calling the the the, the, the screenshot reads Google's strongest security for those who need it most, and they are they're explicitly not suggesting this is for everyone because, as I mentioned last week, and now we have some additional details. There's a trade off, so. It's intended to protect the accounts of, quote, those most at risk of targeted attacks, like journalists, business leaders, and political campaign teams. Um, the main defense is a physical security key used for authentication, and it requires the, the use of Chrome. That is their browser, because that's the other side of this authentication uh, requirement so you can't you have you have to use chrome can't use a non-chrome browser um and there are several trade-offs one is this you have to have a physical security key so that's not free i mean there there's some cost to that which is used to guard against phishing because the physical security key will be required every time you log into a device 
You can't even do, you know, like, remember me. Um, so this will replace and disable all other forms of authentication, including SMS, thank goodness, but even the Google Authenticator app. Sorry, physical key required. Um, also, it limits data access and sharing. Third-party apps will no longer have access to Gmail or your Google Drive. Um, and email is only available through Gmail or inbox clients. Um, so since iOS apps do not support security keys, Google Notes, uh, Google has noted in their documentation that Apple Mail, Contacts, and Calendar apps will not work. Um, and users will be forwarded to, uh, you know, standard apps on iOS. And uh, Google services that require a sign-in, like Photos, will only be available through Chrome. And then finally, uh, uh, the last measure is that uh, it's designed to encounter impersonators who claim to be locked out of their account. Again, yeah. we've, you know, we've mm -hmm. talked, talk, talked about the weakest link. The yep. weakest link is account recovery. It's like, oh, I'm, you know, I forgot my password. And it's like, oh, fine, here, we'll mail it to you. Or, or, or we'll send you a link that, you know, blah, blah, blah. So Google notes that these extra steps, like that, that uh, uh, reviews and requests for more details will be there in place during account recovery process. So, so the, the recovery process will take a few days, they are saying. Wow. In other words, yes. So this is not free. A physical key is required. And with it comes substantial, I mean, but correct. They're doing the right thing. You know, as we often talk about, there is a security versus convenience trade-off. If you have convenience, you don't have security. If you have the convenience of one-click password recovery, there's no security there. So, I mean, so Google has decided How do you they're going to get serious. Um, uh, good question. I don't think they say. Uh, they probably uh, approach celebrities what, and at then, risk what, what happens if, yeah, because, well, um, there is this dialogue. Uh, what happens if, if, if you Google... Advanced protection program. Yeah, because I, can I you, do this. Yeah. I'm actually doing it. You can kind of do it anyway. Uh, so what uh, What I do with, uh, in fact, this came about, remember I was talking uh, a couple of weeks ago about how somebody had hacked Hover, my, uh, uh, right. DN, my yours as well, my domain yes. uh, uh, registrar, registrar, and added a email, because I use them for email redirection, and added another email account to the redirection so that they were getting recovery emails. So one way to mitigate that, I decided to stop using my main email address for all of this stuff, uh, but to create a special address on an unknown, on a server no one knows about yep. as my recovery address. Uh, that yep. way you can't guess it anyway, and you'd have to somehow get access to that server. It did. Rec it's interesting, with LastPass, which is of course the thing I secure most uh, aggressively, I had to re it re encrypted all my keys when I did that. So I had to re log in the LastPass everywhere. I use a YubiKey for two factor on LastPass, which is great because you can't, unlike Google, you can't, re you know, revoke it or say, well, let me use some other method. If once you right. turn on you, you know, uh, hardware two factor on you on LastPass, you, you either have to have that or approve an email to the recovery address that says, okay, yeah, turn off the YubiKey. So I feel like that's pretty secure. Uh, Google, yeah. unfortunately, does, if you can't remember, you know, if you can't authenticate one way, Google, that gives you 20 ways you can authenticate, which yes. I wish it and didn't yeah. do. And that is the problem. And so in this program, they've said, no, it's not free. We're going to, but we're going to give people a, an option to have really strong security with a bunch of trade-offs. That is, you know, your, your Gmail is siloed essentially and cannot be accessed by, uh, you know, by other apps and of other facilities and account recovery. We're going to really make that difficult. Looks like you can do it. Just go to ah. uh, uh, it's landing.google.com/advancedprotection, and I see a get started button. 
So it says you'll need two security keys. Yes, that's what we discussed last week. Buy one Bluetooth key that'll work on your phone with a cable. Buy, all right, I already have a Yubico Fido compatible. And then they say buy a, wow, so I need to go out and buy a key. Wait for keys, and then you can turn on advanced protection. Wow. And is there a cost? Is there a, do they, is there a billing to it, well, or is it just? See. Let's see. Oh, now it's going to, see, there's that pop-up that I just, I don't know how to trust. I guess at this yeah. point I could look at a certificate because it's it's a page, but there's the login. First login, I'll uh, I'll figure out what it costs. I might do it. Okay. I'm I'm a I'm a target, right? You are for sure. Yeah. Okay, so uh, one note of miscellany, and that is I want to I want to make peace with my listeners. Uh oh. Oh. Who are. In love with the Orville. <laughs> because I'm not. <laughs> you, you I tried, tried it again. You? Yeah. I, I watched the Krill episode. And when they finally went into the chapel for Krill services, I just thought, this is just not serious enough for me. And that's it. It's I, I'm sci-fi for me is not humorous. I, and I understand. I've even, I've had some very good friends of mine recommend it. I mean, people I really respect, Trekkies, saying, "Oh, Steve, make sure you're seeing the Orville." It's like, uh, well, I did make sure. I saw the first episode. I, I got it ten minutes into that one. It's like, ah, uh, no. This one, I just kind of hung in there. But finally, I thought, no, it's just you know, it's not for me. But please, I get it that a lot of people like it, but we don't all have to like the same thing. So. You know, peace. So um, one roadblock on this, <laughs> the, yes. the the security key that Google recommends is currently unavailable. But, <laughs> whoops. Uh, so I guess why you need two keys. One is U.S. One needs, it says one that you can work with a cable connected to a tablet or a phone. So that's the problem with the Yuba key is there's no. Uh, to power it. Probably in order in order for it to get power. Oh, they recommend this Fatian multi-pass Fido security key. I already have a Yubo, YubiKey compatible with Fido, which is my YubiKey four. But I don't. I'm not sure what the requirements are of this Bluetooth key that'll work on your phone. I can't really use a YubiKey on my phone. So uh, that must. Um, so if it's Bluetooth, it must have a battery in it. And so it uses uh, BTLE. Oh, I get it. I get yes. it. Yeah, BLE for and, compatible mobile devices. Yeah. So there is an NFC, uh, you know, the NEO, YubiKey NEO has NFC in it. But it, I don't know if they make a – so I'm looking for a B, I probably don't have to use this Fatian. I can use anything that has BLE. Right. This one has a rechargeable battery. Yeah, you're right. You nailed it. Okay. So at least I know what I can look for here. Hmm. hmm. And, All right. And you – know, I distracted right, and, them from the Orville. That was my plan. <laughs> what? Orville? Good job, what? Leo. What is the Orville? Good huh? job. What? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I got a nice note from uh, Christopher Ting of Powell Technologies in Johnson City, Tennessee. Uh, this was yesterday, the 16th. Uh, and, of course, the subject was another SpinRite testimonial for you. He said, hey, Steve, I'm a longtime user of SpinRite and longtime listener of Security Now. Wanted to send you a quick success story in case you wanted one for an upcoming episode. Yeah, like the day after. Thank you very much, Christopher. He says, my dad called me a few days ago telling me his Windows PC was suddenly telling him his second hard drive, the one on which he stores all his important data, was not formatted. It was the dreaded this drive is not formatted. Would you like to reformat it? Yes, no message. He said, after telling him to immediately click no and remove the drive, he brought the drive over to my house and I mounted it into my PC. As I expected, my Windows PC had the same problem accessing any information on this drive. So at this point, we're talking a total loss of all of his dad's important data, which he explicitly and deliberately stores on this on this second drive. 
uh, he, and, and he writes, saw it as raw instead of NTFS. He says, I immediately rebooted into Spinrite, ran a level two on it. It was a standard 250 gig SATA drive, so the estimated time to complete was under 40 minutes. At around the 95% mark, Spinrite detected a sector that needed deeper analysis. And after about three minutes, it was ultimately marked as unrecoverable. The rest of the drive checked out okay. Thinking that the one unrecoverable item was the cause of my dad's original issue, I felt certain that I would reboot only to find I had the same issue and that his data was officially toast. But to my pleasant surprise, the drive and its original partition were there and were now fully accessible. I immediately copied all his data onto my PC and will be replacing his with another in the near future. Dad's happy, and of course, that makes me happy. Kudos to such a great product, Steve. Thanks, Christopher Ting. And I'll just note that, first of all, we've seen instance after instance where even when Spinrite doesn't explicitly acknowledge that it fixed something, everything is fine afterwards. But the other thing that I wanted to remind Chris and others of is that unrecoverable only means not every single bit was recovered. But there are 4,096 bits in a sector. And if the sector is part of the drive's d directory system, the file system metadata, you don't necessarily need all the bits. And Spinrite does a partial reconstruction even if it cannot do a full reconstruction. So even if that sector was actually the problem, and we don't know whether or not it was, Spinrite will get you, for example, 4,090 out of 4,096 of the bits and, and put them back and make the sector readable where it wasn't before. So that, in many instances, that's enough to allow the drive to then say, oh, I have a partition again and allow access to it. So, you know, there's, I, I often see a lot of people talking about how, oh, you know, uh, uh, it didn't perform full recovery, so it, it didn't do anything useful. It's like, uh, well, actually, that's not the case. So uh, we've talked about how large a gray area there is between everything working perfectly and nothing working at all and how Spinrite is often able to pull a drive back out of the gray, back into the light. So uh, it did so in this case. And Christopher, thanks for sharing. So okay. I've done some research. Ah, good. Uh, Google, you're exactly right. Google's a little more clear about the two security keys that are needed for their advanced uh, protection. And the reason you need to, uh, if you didn't ever use anything with iOS, you'd be okay. But because NFC would be sufficient, USB and NFC would be sufficient for Android and most computers. However, iPhone and iPad don't support NFC. They only support uh -huh. Bluetooth LE, right? So you need two keys, one like a Ubico 4, which that's what I have already. And then another, as you said, with battery, because to do BLE, you got to have battery. It yep. has to support FIDO UTF. That's the weaker Google version of Squirrel. <laughs> and and uh, this does, this is from, I don't know, I don't want to think about the company. I've ordered one. We'll see what happens. From Vasco Data Security. They call it their uh, DigiPass. Vasco's, Va Vasco are good people. Okay. And so this is a, uh, it has a USB dongle, which is kind of interesting. But it also supports BLE. So this will work with iOS uh, as well as all the other devices. So I'm going to get this to supplement a YubiKey because I'm going to do it as an experiment. Good, good, good. And I'll be your guinea pig on this. Cause I, boy, and I thought that the newer, like from iPhone, was it 6? I thought we all had NFC now in our iPhone. We do, but only Apple thought, can use it. 
Ah, uh, okay, got it. Yeah, and it's only used for Apple Pay to this to at this point. Right. So, right. so uh, yeah, and then I'll let you I'll let you know if I can get through all of this. I'll let you know what the cost is in a second. Yeah, <laughs> for advanced Good. protection. Cool. But I think if I've got my Google and my LastPass really locked securely locked down, I'm not worried about so much about the rest of it, right? Yes, I think yeah. you 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 need a an anchor which is secure, yes. and then everything flows from that. Got it. Thank God I've got you, Steve. <laughs> Have you brushed so your closing, tongue lately? Clo <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. Keep going. I'll talk about that later. Okay, one second. Uh, closing the loop. We've got a couple uh, nice bits of feedback from our listeners. Uh, I, I guess he would call himself Crack Ruckles. Uh, that's his, his Twitter handle. Crack ruckles. Crack ruckles. He said he's he actually tweeted to both of us. Said just found a great site to show what info is leaked from your browser and torrent clients. And I, you, 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 aye, Leo, aye. and our listeners, ipleak.net, and it's a little sobering to see. Just going to this site, you know, there have been many of these through the years that we've talked about, but this is pretty comprehensive. IPLeak.net. Kind of looks like shields and, up, and it just populates and it keeps on going and yeah. uh, shows you all kinds of stuff. That's uh, you know. Now, Father Robert uh, said I shouldn't show my IP address on the air, but I don't think there's anything particularly secret about the Twit IP address. I, yeah, the only I mean the only thing I could see is that it, it would subject you to some you know DOS attacks. Oh, perhaps, I'm not but, worried about that. We got plenty of uh, yeah, exactly. Protection here. This is good. So this actually would be useful when I use my uh, tiny hardware firewall with the VPN and Tor. Be some, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Go to ipleak.net and okay. see what it shows you. Very nice. Steve Arino, whose handle is Da Moisture. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> he said, okay. security at USAA Bank. Okay, this is security at USAA Bank. Just tried to tell me, quote, they have done the research oh, dear. and found that shorter passwords oh, are more secure what? than longer passwords. What? <laughs> when I complained about their website's 12-character password limit. So, Steve Arino, uh, they're not used to talking to security now, mm. listeners, who know better. They're used to talking to people's, mm, I don't know, you know, cousins who just like, uh, what? Okay, really? Okay, that, well, that's good to know. I didn't realize that shorter passwords are better. <laughs> now I don't have to worry. That's right. Ryan Scullin said, how would Dane, which is the, uh, the technology we talked about a week or two ago, uh, where DNSSEC is being used to provide certificates, how would Dane prevent man-in-the-middle attacks? Well, and the answer is that one of the requirements for some man-in-the-middle attacks is DNS spoofing. And so it's really not Dane as much as it is DNSSEC, which prevents various DNS attacks, which are part of, which essentially are, are carried out by uh, somehow arranging for someone to get the wrong IP address for a domain they believe is legitimate, and then, and then going there for uh, spoofing. So it's not exactly tied in. But Eric Volbrecht asked, "How is publishing a public key via DNSSEC any different than a self-signed TLS certificate, other than the method of distribution?" Okay, well, it's that last caveat. Uh, so, Eric, you're right. It's not. You you essentially are publishing a self-signed TLS certificate. It's TLSA is the is the is the protocol used, and and but it but the key is the method of distribution. If your a self-signed certificate is less secure because you don't have a secure means of 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 sharing it, essentially. If you get a self-signed certificate from a from a site you're visiting, that and your and your browser says, "Oh, this site's certificate is self-signed. Do you want to trust it?" Well, you say, "Yeah," but 
you could be at the wrong site. And now you're trusting the self-signed certificate from the wrong site, from a spoofed site. So the beauty with DNSSEC is by, by securely and authenticatively obtaining this certificate for the connection, you solve the problem of distribution. So, Eric, you kind of answered your, your question. Other than the method of distribution, there's no difference. But it is the, it is the securability of the distribution of the key, which that's as useful as the key being signed by someone you trust, which is the, the current certificate authority model that we're all operating under today. So either you get a certificate from someone you hope is correct, but it's been signed by someone you trust, therefore you trust it, or you have a secure channel, a secure means of authenticating the source of the certificate, which is what DNSSEC uh, and Dane under DNSSEC provides. And Barbara asked regarding the security.txt file that we discussed last week. Remember the one that will be coming soon uh, to, to run alongside robots.txt. She asks, what stops bad guys from spamming the contact email address? That's exactly the thought that I had. And I forgot to mention it last week. So thank you, Barbara. Um, one of the things you can put in the security.txt file is your email address. You can also provide a place to pick up your PGP key um, to allow people to send you uh, encrypted secure email that only you can decrypt, which is useful if they want to establish a, a secure dialogue with you. But you can also give them a URL. And so what I would, what I will do because I, Naturally, bots, you know, bad bots, spam bots are going to be scrubbing the net looking for security.txt files. I won't put an email address there. I will put a link to a form which has, you know, I'm not a robot uh, captcha stuff in order to prevent spamming. So the solution is you can do many things. You can put many things in the security.txt file, one being not an email address but rather a link to a web page where you can then do anything you want to. So you are able to take it out of the email channel if you choose. Richard Petri said, um, he said, you, you asked one last week's episode. Oh, I'm sorry. He must have meant you meant on last week's episode, why people were adverse to printing password recovery tokens. That is to say, I, I actually talking about why they're, adverse to printing QR codes. And he responded, I have no physical security. And that's, of course, an absolutely valid point. I do. I'm able to, you know, my environment is just me. And so I'm able to provide adequate physical security for the slips of paper where I have my QR codes printed. But I completely get it that if your environment is inherently got a lot of people coming and going and you don't have control over it, then yes, I would ag absolutely agree that without physical security, you'd be better off printing them to a PDF or, or, you know, s s taking screenshots and then storing them in a safe fashion online where you do have security over access. And finally, Brad Ducks said, Regarding people wanting no password for Squirrel, he says the protocol is open. So do, do you not expect people to release implementations without a password? It's a very good point. And the, the password requirement is for the client. That is, the password is not only is the protocol open, the protocol never discusses passwords. The passwords are not even in the squirrel protocol because, for example, biometrics, uh, a fingerprint or facial recognition or whatever you want to do 
could be used. It could be the the physical proximity of Leo, the 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 Bluetooth key, or or you know th that you'll be getting. Anything could be used as the additional factors. The reason we need some control is that we are turning our authentication over to Squirrel as a third party. So we want to make sure that's not abused, that that there's some interaction of some kind that permits Squirrel to authenticate on our behalf. Nothing in the protocol requires it. And in fact, even my client allows you to reduce it to a single keystroke if you want to, after you provide the long secure password once. So, I mean, and, and I think users are going to actually see that it is just not burdensome. Um, normally, that we, we call it the quick pass is the first four characters of your much longer password. You have to provide that once. And then from then on, per authentication, it's just, you know, one, two, three, four. Just, you know, you're able to just type the first four characters and you don't have, even have to hit enter because the system knows that it's four characters. So, it, I mean, we've really streamlined it. I think people are going to be, won't feel that it's any barrier. But technically, Brad, you're right. Not only is there nothing to prevent people from doing non-password-based squirrel clients, I mean, I don't think anyone would want to use one once they understood that anybody could come along and click on the QR code on a page and be logged in as them. They they would want some protection. So um, it's available. Nice. I'm using my tiny hardware firewall, VPN, and BitTorrent, and uh, my my lappy thinks IP leak thinks I'm in Hungary. Nice. I like that. <laughs> and it says it can't figure out what my IP address is at all, <laughs> let alone leaking DNS requests or WebRTC requests. It's just confused as all get out. So Perfect. Yeah, it does. It's really amazing how much information the browser leaks, however. That's oh, my goodness. I know. Really frustrating. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. They're just pouring out yeah. crap. I mean, like, 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 like which extensions you've got yeah. installed. Right. And, of course, that's a fingerprint yeah. technique. There's probably enough unique information in its yep. in its configuration here to to fingerprint me to still track you even though you're yeah. coming out of Hungary. Yeah. <laughs> What's Leo doing in Budapest? <laughs> well, he's been traveling a lot lately. You know, he's liking those vacations. Why is his Surface laptop in Budapest. Um, I do. I have to say, I at some point I'd love for you to to just uh, certify if you can Wi-Fi consulting in their. Uh, black hole cloud uh, VPN because what one thing we're learning especially in, in light of crack is that VPNs are not all made the same and some of them are right. actually horrible uh, in fact there was a story that I let go by last week about VPN logging yeah. of everything that that their yeah. that their own clients and their own customers right. were doing right. I'm pretty sure these guys are great and I've been using them for years. And I and I love the fact that I'm going through hardware. This thing appears to be an Ethernet uh, dongle, right? Nice. But then it has two Wi-Fi radios, and it's just very clever, I think. Anyway, it's also pretty fast, which is nice. Let's talk about brushing your tongue. You've avoided this topic. Oh, I I <laughs> thought you'd never get around to it, Leo. <laughs> it's time for tongue. T U N G. Uh, they, they're huge Security Now fans, and they really wanted to, to, to be on here. And I said, well, i got to have to get a tongue and try it. I've been using a tongue for a couple of months now, and I love it. It's in addition to your regular toothbrush. It is a, it's kind of a different-looking uh, toothbrush. It's round, and there's a reason for that, which I'll explain in a bit. It also comes with a special tongue gel with zinc. See, 90% of bad breath comes from your tongue, from bacteria living on your tongue. That sticky bacteria that hides out in the nooks and crannies of the tongue and gives off sulfur gas. Whew, ew. So cleaning, and it's also, by the way, this is more than just cosmetic. That, that bacteria contributes to periodontal disease, and that's linked to heart disease, diabetes, and colon cancer. We're learning more and more that the bacterial ecosystem in your body has a lot to do with your overall health. 
So let's get rid of that tongue dung. <laughs> the biofilms, by the way, you say, well, wait a minute. I, I rinse my mouth out with mouthwash and so forth. Well, you know how in your hot tub, <laughs> there's this slimy biofilm that'll build up? Bacteria is so smart. It's so evolved. It protects itself with a, a layer of, this is what's slippery, bacteria, dead bacteria that insulates the live bacteria underneath it from the chlorine in your hot tub, from the alcohol in your mouthwash. you got to brush it to break up the biofilm. That's the tongue dung. Your toothbrush is too soft. You don't want a hard toothbrush on your teeth. It's too tall. It will choke you. <laughs> It'll gag you. And it's too narrow. Besides, you don't want to use a tooth, the same toothbrush on your tongue that you use on your teeth because you don't want to seed your gums with the, to the tongue. It's hot. I, I know I sound nuts, but I have to tell you, this is, this is uh, read up on it. So this is the first brush designed for your tongue. It's round with short but firm bristles that penetrate the tongue's hard-to-reach crevices and remove that, that biofilm and the odor-causing bacteria beneath it. Uh, plus, because it's got a wide head and a low profile, it, it, you don't get the gag reflex, and you cover a lot of surface area. It's literally 10 seconds. You brush your teeth, and then for 10 seconds, you use the tongue brush and the tongue gel with zinc, which ne neutralizes the odor-causing gases, and tastes great, and you, it leaves you with a wonderful, minty, fresh taste. With tongue... You don't have to wonder about your breath anymore, and you can be sure that your, you know, your 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 biome in your mouth is not making you ill. So we got a deal for you: ten percent off the partner pack. That's what we sent Steve, because you don't just want to do it for yourself. You want to do it with your <laughs> loved one, if you know what I mean. That's yeah, right. Yeah, baby. Although my mine was, I, I got a red and a blue one, so you know, well, his and hers. Uh, we don't want to assume, you know, any genders. You can get whatever oh, you want. I got a okay, white one. Yeah. But you do want two different colors so you know whose is whose. Um, the t you'll get two tongue brushes, a three-ounce tongue gel, which, by the way, lasts a really long time because you just use a little dollop on there. You're going to love how you feel. Even if it didn't have all these benefits, you'll just go, hmm, I like that. Tongue brush, T-U-N-G, T-U-N-G, not, not, not how you normally spell tongue. Tonguebrush.com slash security now. And if you use the offer code security now, 10% off. And you have to try this. Just try it for me. Uh, and I think you're going to really love it. And I So least, you're saying halitosis, hallelujah. Hallelujah. No more tongue dung. <laughs> uh, Lisa and I both use it. It is great, but you need to both use it. I'm just saying. I don't know why, but I've been told. <laughs> tongue tonguebrush.com slash security now detongue detongue your loved one's tongue with tongue it's still the best name T-U-N-G I love it I love that. Yeah. these guys are huge security now fans and they said please would you we just want people to know about this and at first I said come on but then I used it and I said well you know what I kind of like it and once I understood the kind of the biology of this it made a lot of sense uh, tongue brush T-U-N-G brush dot com slash security now we thank them for being fans and for making it us more kissable because God knows geeks need help with that <laughs> if you know what I'm saying continuing on let's talk crack so okay um, we've discussed over the years Wi-Fi details Wi-Fi crypto extensively um but I need to do a little bit of a review because there haven't been any like horrific problems. I mean, remember Leo back in the beginning of the podcast? I mean, we there was stuff happening. Wep, Wep oh. and and oh my goodness, Wep. and TKIP and RC4 and all these problems. That's associated. what's so terrifying about this because we had settled for five or six years now on the simple recommendation: you don't need to do anything else; just use WPA. To PSK and your network secure. Yes, actually, since uh, it's been twelve years since two thousand five. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we just all gotten kind of happy. Yeah. Uh, um, so, okay, so I have to lay a little bit of foundation for people to understand the nature of why what's happened is a problem. Um, 
in in cryptography, there are two broad categories of ciphers. Um, there are block ciphers and stream ciphers. In a in a block cipher, which is, for example, what you use if you're going to encrypt your hard drive, the 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 cipher algorithm itself, like AES, is itself a block cipher. And and if in case of AES, it uses 128 bits, which is uh, 16 bytes. And so that divides evenly into the size of a sector and everybody's happy because everything kind of works right. Communications like Wi-Fi use stream ciphers. Um, and and stream ciphers and the ones that are that are used with Wi-Fi use this magic XOR, which is really kind of cool the way it works. And we've often talked about both the power and the danger of exclusive OR. The way to think of XOR is that so it's the difference between two bits. So if the two bits are zero, well, they're the same. So the XOR is zero. If they're both ones, again, they're the same. So the XOR is zero. But if they're different, if the two bits are different, if it's zero and one or one and zero, then the XOR of those two bits is one. So it's so think of XOR as the difference between the, the two inputs. And, and I'll just say briefly that that's the whole secret of RAID 5. That's the way RAID 5 works. If you have two drives and you want to be protected against either of them failing, you add a third drive, which is the XOR of the first two. That is, it, it's the difference between those first two drives. And so as data is written to either of these two drives, the third drive is kept synchronized. It's always kept updated to be the difference between the first two drives. Now, if the third drive, that one were to die, well, who cares? You know, it's like, okay, go, go get another one. You just lost your difference drive, but it doesn't matter because you've still got your first two. But if either one of the first two dies, think about it. You can figure out what the, what the other drive of that first pair was by comparing the surviving drive to the difference drive, to the XOR drive. And that allows you to compute the entire contents of the drive that died. That's how RAID 5 works. So anyway, the, the, that just something as simple as the, the, this XOR operation is it's very powerful. And the other thing that we've talked about in the past when we've talked about stream ciphers is something very counterintuitive. If you took plain text just a, a, a plain text stream of bits that is readable and it's clear for everybody to see and you XOR that stream with noise, with randomness, the output is the best encryption in the world, which is like, what? Is that, is that simple? Yes. If, because XORing with random noise it, it, it randomly inverts bits of the stream. And there's no way to know from the output which bits were inverted. And so that's what's sort of difficult conceptually to, to like believe. It's like, well, if you just flipped a few the right bits back, then you'd have the original plain text. It's like, yes, but you don't know which bits. And so it's, it's weird that taking plain text and just XORing it with a random stream of bits is un unbreakable. It's really strong crypto. And here's the key 
when it comes to Wi-Fi, because that's what Wi-Fi does, is it it simply generates a pseudo-random bit stream and XORs the data that's being sent. And then the other end generates the identical pseudo-random bit stream and XORs what's received which recovers the plain text and that works now there are some there are some requirements though for security because powerful as this xoring plain text with something pseudo random is in the same you, you can kind of get a sense for the danger in the same way that the raid drive was like a lost drive was recoverable there is a danger if you if you know what the plain text was and you can see what the encrypted data is that reveals the stream it if you xor the plain text and the cipher text you get the bit stream so it, so this has to be used very carefully. It's very fast, very lightweight, very secure. We've all been happily using it for 12 years. Uh, well, and stream ciphers for, for me even longer. As long as your source of, of the pseudo-random data is good, you're okay. Now, the problem is that we need to use a static key. That is, the key needs to be agreed upon by the endpoints and not change. But we, but the danger with a stream cipher is ever reusing the same stream. That's the problem. You cannot, you must provide a mechanism for ever prevent, from ever allowing the same pseudo random stream to be reused um, against the uh, uh, against the plain text because if you do that, it turns out it's trivial to crack it. So to solve that problem, that is not needing every packet to have its own key, but as but have long lived keys, they introduce the notion of. And this is something we've talked about in the past, an initialization vector, an IV. And the concept there is that it can be known, but it must never be duplicated. So the idea is that when, you, when you're starting to encrypt a packet, you increment this nonce, which can just be a counter, um, and that's the initialization vector. It mixes in with the key to produce a unique pseudo-random bit stream for that packet. The other side has a synchronized nonce, and it's got the same key. So it's able to increment the nonce packet by packet and, and reconstruct the same pseudo-random bit stream to get the data to decrypt the data by re-XORing it against the same pseudo-random bit stream and out comes the plain text. Okay, so now that means never repeating the bit stream used to XOR the plain text is crucial. It turns out, not surprisingly, that's not guaranteed. Um, what these researchers, two guys from Belgium, figured out was there was a way with a lot of preconditions to, to force a reuse of the nonce, which, as I said, is absolutely disallowed. So um, when a client, meaning iOS or iPad or Android device or a Mac or a PC, that is anything that's not an access point, that is anything that wants to connect to an access point, that's the client, also known in the terminology as the supplicant, um, as opposed 
to the authenticator when the when the the, the client wants to connect to a Wi-Fi access point, it sends an authentication request. The, uh, the access point sends an authentication response. Then the client, th that is an authentication response back to the client. The client sends an association request and the access point sends an association response. So those are the, that, that's the first back and forth. Then... The act, and so now, no, so the, those, the, the, that sort of just gets things rolling between the two. That establishes their agreement to then negotiate secrets. So that is just authentication and association to sort of, uh, sort of establish the, 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 the dialogue between them, but no secrets yet. So then they do what's known as the four-way handshake. That is, after those first, then they do the four-way handshake. The, auth the, the access point sends the first of the four messages to the client containing its nonce, which is, so it makes up a random value, sends it to the client. The client then uses a its own nonce with the one it received from the access point to derive what's called the the PTK which is one of the keys used for Wi-Fi and then it sends its nonce back to the access point that's the second of the four packets in the four-way handshake now the access point has the nonce it sent and the nonce it received so it's able to derive the identical PTK key so now both sides having exchanged nonces um, have their th th this PTK key after two packets what the first one from the authenticator from from the access point the second one from the client now the access point sends message number three of the four uh containing an additional key and the client finally sends the fourth packet of this four-way handshake back to the authenticator the and, and so that's the four-way handshake. That's the way things normally go. What these guys discovered, essentially, was there had been a mistake made from the beginning, from the, from the first moment that this technology was designed, which, which arises if the client's fourth packet, that fourth phase of the handshake, it sending back essentially a confirmation. If that never arrives, the access point will resend message three, uh -oh. thinking that, you know, not knowing whether message four got lost or dro dropped or collided with or whatever in transit, not knowing that the client didn't get message three. All it know, all the access point knows is that it didn't get message four, which, which is the result of the client receiving message three. So it resends three. It turns out that the protocol has an error, such that the when any client receives message three, it resets the nonce, and that's the vulnerability. As I said, you, we, we cannot ever allow the, the, any encrypted data to be re-encrypted under, uh, under the same bit stream. Well, the keys are not going to change. We're relying on the nonces to change. So if we re-zero the nonce, we're going to get. We're going to reuse the same bitstream, and that collapses our security. So 
this in turn th- this it turns out is difficult to implement in practice okay so assuming that you don't have no no one assumes we have an evil access point because after all it's the access point that you're trying to talk to there's no reason to have an evil access point that like is maliciously resending that third message in order to cause the client to reset its nonce because the access point knows what the client's saying anyway. So, th- so one of the things that was not well covered is this requires a man in the middle. That's one of the first things that has to happen. There, you, This is a man in the middle attack, meaning that a third party has to somehow arrange to intercept the communications between the access point and the client. Well, in a wireless mode with radio, that's not super difficult, except that it's a little complicated because the MAC address of both of the nodes, both of these endpoints, is mixed in to the crypto material. So a man in the middle can't have a different MAC address if it's tr- pretending to be the access point for the client or none of the crypto will work. It'll all break. So so the man in the middle has to have the same MAC address, except you can't have two of the same MAC addresses on the same Ethernet. And remember that Wi-Fi is just a version of Ethernet. So the way these guys very cleverly solve the problem is they run the, their attacking man in the middle radio on a different channel with the same MAC address as the access point. That way the crypto doesn't break and there's no inter MAC collision because they're deliberately on different radio channels. So, so now this, this rather sophisticated man in the middle has to be within radio range of everybody and has to be quick on the draw, able to intercept and essentially it's impersonating the access point to the client and it's impersonating the client to the access point. And it uses its man in the middle position to maliciously resend that third message to the client in order to force the client to reset its nonce because of a protocol documentation error that's always been there. And just that crashes the rest of the link security. Now, it's true. Yes, yes. So, okay, so several things. First of all, notice that all of this is the client, is on the client side. That's why I said it's not technically necessary for any of us to worry about our access points. This is, it's a malicious access point in the middle that is the problem, leveraging the client's logic on the client side. So that's really what needs to get fixed. It'll be good for us to update our access points because access points can behave as clients if they're connecting to another access point. That is when you want to connect like a mesh, if if you have any kind of a mesh system per the Wi-Fi protocol, somebody is the access point, somebody is the client. Or in, in the Wi-Fi terminology, one is the authenticator, the other is the supplicant. So it's the supplicant side, the client side, where the vulnerability exists. So it'll be good for us to update our firmware, but it's not crucial. What's crucial is that the things that connect to the access points, the clients, that's what needs to get updated. But also understand, I mean, somebody has to want to do this. I mean, it's going to require, and, and there are no tools yet available for exploiting this. It'll be, it'll be nice to see whether there are some, some tests that become publicly available. And I imagine there will be some. Yeah, he has a where, Python script he demonstrated. And he said, yes. as soon as it's mitigated, 
after a reasonable amount of time, he'll release the Python script. But I wonder now, does he have to have some specialized hardware, or could he just use, uh, you know, the laptop Wi-Fi radio to do all this? Um, well, for example, what we could do, you could put this as a um, – someone could build a test in an access point because it's the access point um, abusing the protocol to the client – that is the problem. So, but, but for example, anything can be an access point. So you could, for example, have a laptop. You do an with ad running hoc. Soft, yes, exactly. A Wi-Fi laptop network, ru- yeah. running this Python script, which it, which appears as an access point. Right. Then what, then you would have your, your other devices, your, your tablets and your Android and your iOS Simulate clients. The supplicant. Connecting to it. Yeah. Connecting to it as the Wi-Fi radio and see whether they are robust against this attack. So um, it turns out. But could out, you as perpetrate the attack from a laptop? Is what I'm. Yes, you could. You could. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So 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 that that that's the way it would be done. Is somebody sitting at Starbucks, for example, to, you could put, <laughs> to in, use a, you my could put in a pineapple? Use, probably. Right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Or a Raspberry Pi. Anything right. that had a Wi-Fi radio. Uh, would be able to do that. Yes. So, uh, as by weird coincidence, Microsoft and Apple misimplemented the original insecure specification in a way that made them invulnerable to this. They, 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 they the way they, the the specs showed that. And and the spec is a little unclear too. Uh, uh, Matthew Green had an interesting statement about how this happened, saying that really, you know, the IEEE process, the IEEE is the organization which is responsible for the Wi-Fi Alliance and for managing the spec. As Matt said, look at anything the IETF has done. And you'll see RFCs and everything in the open for everyone to see and inspect. You can't get the specifications from the IEEE. You have to be a member. You have to pay dues. I mean, I've often been thwarted by wanting to, like, look at at the Wi-Fi spec. It's not public, which is just crazy. That's crazy. It's absolutely wrong that we're all using a non-public, non-published specification. It's just wrong. But that's the game that, they're, that they've always been playing. Maybe uh, uh, something will change. Now, the on Android from 6.0 on, there's a – it's actually the worst of all because there's a, 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 a reading – Oh, I'm sorry. An, a particular implementation which appeared in one of the code bases that Android borrowed from, one of the open source code bases, didn't only re-zero the nonce, it re-zeroed the key. So, so when you do this to an Android 6.0 and later device... It's like worse than anything. It actually switches to a null key, which, of course, everybody knows is all zeros. And so it instantly allows you to to access the communications of the device. So not good. Um, Just trying to think if there's anything else. Um, Oh, yes. Remediation. Um, All that is necessary to fix this is that a Boolean flag be added to the software. I've, and I've already looked over some of the diff files of those of the source code, which has been updated. And it's, it's simple to fix. You just do a little bit of logic to say, if the key has already been established and I'm getting another message three from the access point, don't clear the nonce. Thank you very much. That's all it is. That's all you have to do. Just don't do that. And had that always been there, we would have never had this problem. Hmm. So it and is. And that's on the client side, not the access yes, point side. Correct. That's really all critical. Of, yeah. Yes. 
Yes. So there need be no panic at all about access points that are not connecting to other access points. A uh, access points. In Although fact, your mesh router some, does do that in effect. Cor yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So so and some of the routers actually have a, a, a checkbox where you can disable it to function as a client. And so if you wanted to be safe until your firmware is updated, if you had the option in your in your access point, if your Wi-Fi router to disable behaving as a client, turn that off and that will make you completely safe. Then it then it can't be used to, uh, you know, as, as as a client in order to connect in which I mean, even then the, the danger is minimal. Um, so, but, but if you had an Android phone or an unpatched Android phone or unpatched iOS phone, it's a client joining a Wi-Fi network. Except iOS was never vulnerable. Right, because it uh, was implemented it, right? Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> uh, but so, if you have so, an Android phone that properly implemented it, and it's a, now it's a client, you can, what do you do? You can watch the traffic between the two because it's unencrypted now? Is that what's going on or... Oh, so yes, so uh, a, a very good point. Thank you. I wanted, I, I, I tweeted this this morning, and I wanted to remind people that, okay, so what this would allow, after an active attack, it would allow passive eavesdropping of some of the traffic. But remember, a VPN, TLS, and HTTPS are all going to be encrypting the traffic anyway. So, so Wi-Fi encryption is an outer wrapping of encryption on top of what goes through it. And now, increasingly, what goes through it is encrypted anyway. Although he so, seems to show on his, and we're, we're, well, I'm watching the video right now, he seems to show that you can now do a man in the middle on the certificate as well. Well, and, yes. And crack so, into a, a TLS traffic. You may be able to do that. What what the, uh, initially they were saying that if you captured the TCP SYN packet, that uh, you could get the the sequence numbers and and intercept the and and assen essentially hijack the TCP connection. I mean, so so the idea is w w they're they're still sort of fleshing out how you leverage. The ability to crack this, um, and I, and you're right. I guess if you if you were to able to get the beginning of the oh, of I the see, he's intercepted the OAuth is what he's intercepted. Ah, uh, so and that's in uh, plain text because you've dis correct. you've pat bypassed the uh, encryption. Correct, but a VPN protects you, so that's really the real lesson yes. here. Yes, yes, a, a VPN protects you and. TLS and HTTPS protect you. So most of our communications today is encrypted even without Wi-Fi encryption. For example, when you, again, Starbucks, you know, that that's a non-encrypted connection. All everybody doing anything in an, in a, in a, in an open Wi-Fi access point is, you know, there's no password there. It, it's all in in the clear. So we're relying on our own encryption, whether by VPN or HTTPS, to protect the data from other people who would otherwise be trying to spy on us. So, I mean, th this is going to get fixed. The good news is uh, Windows did patch it officially last Tuesday, even though... It never really was a big problem. There was, there, there are like three different types of sort of s subsets of this problem, and Windows was technically vulnerable to one of them, but not the main one. Um, and the same thing as the case of iOS, as you said, eleven point one is now at beta, and we and we should have that soon. And after reading this, I wanted to make absolutely sure I was right because I couldn't see how an access point needed to be patched. So I checked their FAQ and they say in their own, the author's FAQ says, what if, um, what if there are no security updates for my router? And they write, our main attack is against the four-way handshake. 
and does not exploit access points, but instead targets clients. So it might be that your router does not require security updates. We strongly advise you to contact your vendor for more details. In general, though, you can try to mitigate attacks against routers and access points by disabling client functionality, which is what I was talking about before, which is, for example, used in repeater modes or mesh and disabling 802.11R fast roaming. For ordinary home users, your priority should be updating clients such as laptops and smartphones. And so that's from these guys who throughout their 16 page paper that I read in order to exactly understand what was going on. I mean, they're, they're finding any possible little, you know, nook and cranny, any little kink anywhere. So for them to say, yeah, you're probably fine with your router. I mean, that's, that means you really are fine with your router, but we do want to get our clients updated. And the, as I said, also at the top of the show, the response that our router vendors generate, even though we don't need to worry about it, it'll give us some nice feedback about how security conscious they are and how responsive they are to these kinds of problems. Uh, Ubuntu has been updated. I've got a bunch of uh, DDWRT is already updated. Uh, OpenBSD is updated. Um, uh, uh, a bleeping computer. I've got a couple links here at the end of the show notes. Bleeping computer has a list of the firmware and driver updates as they're happening. And there's a, another link for a, a page maintaining a list of, of who's done things and who hasn't. So, um, again, it's a, we're a little overheated on the router side because it's not, it's not a vulnerability against the router. It's against the client. And I think we're going to have those updated. And this, of course, this is the, the, the challenge again, once again, with Android is there are an awful lot of Android devices of literally anything that isn't updated for this has probably been vulnerable since 2005. <laughs> so <laughs> all Android ever. <laughs> as as yeah. long as as long as nobody knew about it, that's okay. <laughs> uh, exactly. We just don't know. Um, we know. So just to be clear, and I know you've said this, and I'm reiterating, updating Good. your access point is not a mitigation. Correct. And that's the real problem is that we all have bunches of IoT devices who, you know, whose, you know, companies are long gone or don't care and probably won't be updated. Okay. Now, the good news is this is the link key. That is the, it is the key that's negotiated on the fly from point to point. Okay. It does not reveal your Wi Fi password. But there is let's no, say they hacked no, a camera they'd be able to see the camera traffic, wouldn't they? Correct. Yes. So, yes. So, so it would be the, the traffic to the device uh, could be exposed. Whatever that IoT is sending to the access point yep. is now unencrypted and visible. Yep. Unless it uses TLS or a VPN or something like that. Correct. Okay. Well, I th you're, you, you said in your tweet yesterday, don't worry, and I think, you're, I think you've helped people a little bit. And, you know, frankly, uh, if, if your IoT device is... You know, I don't, I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, doesn't send video and doesn't send, you know, if it's just, if it's like a, a Harmony hub or something, who cares? Yeah. Well, and the, the good IoT devices like the well, to, Amazon. Like Ring and the Echo. Uh, yeah. They're all going to be over TLS. Yeah. Oh, that's so, a good point too. Okay. Yeah. All the good ones, the, the, you know, the real heavy duty IoT devices are going to be encrypted separately. So and so when I looked at the video again, I realized what he was showing was he could see part of the OAuth process. But once, but if you've already got a, a account with this TLS-based website, that's encrypted, and there's no way yes. he can kind of bypass that. Correct. Okay. okay. Correct. So. So the only danger would be non-HTTPS where things like passwords are right. going in the clear. Right. Exactly where, you know, like back in the day with FireSheet, where right. we, we were able to see that stuff in the clear. Right. 
th- this crack breaks the the radio encryption allow in in situations where sensitive data is relying on the radio encryption from point to point which we're actually relying on a lot less today than we have historically oh boy i'm so glad you came on and uh, as as you do every tuesday and uh, reassured us on this one this is this is good good stuff um i will mention that i have ordered the dual dongle setup <laughs> <laughs> for Google Advanced You've got Protection. Dual dongles. They still haven't told me how much it would cost. You have to register your dual dongles, so I have to wait till I get the dual dongles. Dual, dual dongles. Uh, I have next one. Week. But, but next, next week, Tuesday, right? I will be able to tell you. I'll get them Good. on Friday, and uh, uh, Amazon says I should have it by Friday. I already, as I said, I already have uh, an appropriate uh, YubiKey. I just need that BLE device that you charge and all that. And I guess that means from now on, I have to carry those around with me, right? Yes, honey. <laughs> but that's a vulnerability too, because if somebody looks and says, "Oh, he's got a YubiKey and that other thing," well, he must be doing uh, Google there. They could try it, right? Well, we'll see what yeah. Google well, does. And, and 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 again, the reason what we're trying to protect from is Russia, and yes. you know, so you know, so, they're not somebody over mugging there. me. Yeah, even if you're in Hungary, um, I should still, be okay. Yes, I can't wait. Actually, I think that I think that. I don't care about my Twitter, but I'm going to lock uh, Google's. That's my Gmail. That's all my email. I want to lock that down. Yeah, I want to lock down LastPass. Those things really are. Uh, and the idea that that when you switch into this mode with Google, they silo your Gmail so nobody else can get to it. No apps can't connect. I mean, you know, everything good. else is like good. it's firewalled. Good. That sounds pretty yep. good to me. Yep. We'll see. I'll, I'll give you a report next week. Yeah, now I do remember, Leo, when you started using your YubiKey, that it was like never around when you needed it. Yeah, so well, I put it now I on my car key. <laughs> it's on my car there key keychain. And so Perfect. it's always in here. It's always here, but it's sometimes not in the same room. And yeah, you have to get up and go get it and yes. put it in. But it, LastPass only requires you authenticate once every 30 days. Right. Um, so that's not the end of the world, and you just kind of get used to it. And if you are the kind of person who carries your keys or... You know, yeah. yeah. Or maybe I'll just make a little uh, brooch, a dongle brooch, something, you know, that I always have it That's with That's right. We <laughs> want you wearing them around your neck. I bet you people, I bet you sysadmins do that, oh, right? I they wear, guarantee. Yeah, or uh, yeah, a little, a little clip on your Remember when, belt when, or a tie when clip. people were oh, wearing yeah. thumb drives? Yeah. Remember when, sure. when people were wearing thumb drives sure. in, on, on a lanyard? It's I like, remember oh. Waz uh, coming into the screensavers saying, yep. and he had it on a lanyard, he had a USB key, and he said, <laughs> That's two gigabytes on that thing. Oh. And we all went, whoa. <laughs> you must be rich. <laughs> whoa, two gigabytes. It, you're you're can, never going to fill that never up. Never fill that up. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Gibson's the greatest. GRC.com is his website, the Gibson Research Corporation. That's where you go for SpinRite, the world's best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility. You must have it. If you've got hard drives, even SSDs, you gotta, you got to have it. Fix. That should Fixes be the new. Right up. Well, we can make that the new Spin Rights logo. Live long and spin Ooh, I like right. That. Live long yeah. and spin right. Uh, <laughs> or spin right and live long. Uh, he also has lots of free stuff there. You can find out more about Squirrel, of course, perfect paper passwords and password haystacks. And people use uh, his site to generate 64 bit, totally random, 64 byte, totally random uh, passwords. They use his site. Uh, to ver validate, you know the the difficulty of an unencrypting a password. It's all sorts of great stuff. Shields up to test your router. GRC.com. You can also go there and leave feedback or questions. GRC.com/feedback. But the easiest place maybe to reach Steve uh, for that is on his Twitter feed. He allows DMs at sggrc. Do you have 280 characters yet, Steve? I don't because I'm no. using um, TweetDeck. Yeah, I think it doesn't I matter. It. I think it will automatically give you 280 when you can get 280. Maybe not. I don't uh -huh. know. Yeah. Wow. But nobody that I know of has it except for, uh, you know, Julian Assange. Hmm. So, <laughs> for some reason. So, uh, um, GS at SGGRC, keep it brief, I guess is the answer. Although your DMs can be as long as they want. Uh, yeah. Now, we also have the uh, podcast on our site. 
uh, he has it at his site, and not just audio, but also transcripts. We have it on our site, twit.tv slash sn. We have video as well. Uh, and sometimes the video is worth watching because, like, the image of the day and stuff like that, you can see what Steve's talking about, although he does a great job of describing it. We also uh, have a subscription form there so you can find uh, a subscription a way to subscribe on iTunes, a Pocket Cast, Overcast. So that way you get every episode. This is the, the really the one show on uh, on our network that doesn't turn to fish wrap by uh, the next week. It's something you want to keep on hand. There's always lots of very useful stuff. Mr. Gibson, we'll be back next Tuesday, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern Time, 2030 UTC for Security Now. And I'll see you then. Till then, my friend. Bye. Security Now.